Good morning, Grace. Welcome here once again. My name is Clay, one of the pastors, along with Mark, who has given the announcements. We love the scriptures, and if you've been here for any amount of time, you'll know that because we spend a bulk of our time opening the Bible and looking in to see what God has for us. We believe the Bible is God's word to us. It reveals to us our predicament as sinners. It reveals to us God's character and his love for us in sending his son, Jesus, who is God himself, to be what we should have been, to live the life we should have lived, to die the death we should have died, to rise again, conquering our enemies of Satan, sin, death, and hell. And we get this all within the Bible. It's an amazing unfolding story of how God is just so good and yet humanity continues to fall and yet God continues to be patient. So rather than our usual line-by-line, verse-by-verse study of a particular book like we were doing in John, which we will continue in the fall again, for the summer we decided let's do things a little bit differently and so we're studying in a broader sense the two books of 1st and 2nd Samuel. And these books chronicle the lives of two of Israel's first kings, Saul and David. So last week Mark brought us through uh, 1 Samuel chapter 24, and this week we're actually going to skip ahead quite a few chapters, quite a few pages. We're going to go to 2 Samuel 6. So if you want to open your Bibles to 2 Samuel 6, you can join in with me. You can do that in book or app form. Either is entirely acceptable. If you didn't bring a Bible with you, your phone doesn't seem to have internet in here, you can grab a Bible at the back. If you don't own one at all, you can take that home as our gift to you. We want you to be able to read God's Word, enjoy it, and discover for yourself what this says. Because I could say something, Mark could say something, we want you to know what the Bible says. Trust what the Scriptures say more than what we say. So before we start, let's just pray. I want us to get into the story, but I want us to have our minds and our hearts right. So Father... I pray right now that you would give us eyes to see, give us ears to hear what you want us to hear this morning. Speak to us through your word. Help us to glorify you, to understand you, to grow in our hope of what you've done. Give us joy, peace, and love for you and love for others based on what we see in the scripture. I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. So what we're going to see here today is an amazing picture of the fear of man and of worship. Now, the fear of man, it's a phrase that Christians often use to describe when someone worries more about what other people think about them than they care about what God thinks about them. So in reality, it's another form of pride because we care about how we're perceived by others. And so we orchestrate our lives to look a certain way, act a certain way, do certain things to impress other people. And we completely ignore God in the process. More often than not, when others who are associated with us act in ways that we deem to not fit with our picture of how they should act, it's often fear of man because we're worried about how it reflects on us more than why are they doing what they're doing? Are they doing it for God? So we completely Forget about God. It's all about us. It's all about how respectable we are. God's not even part of the equation. And this is what fear of God does. It removes God from the equation. And so we become slaves to ourselves, slaves to our own reputations, slaves to others' opinions of us. And it distracts us and it removes our ability to worship God as he deserves. Fear of man does this to us. And so we don't even live our lives for God because we're so scared about what others think of us. Now in this section that we're going to go through today, we're going to see that the author of the book of 2 Samuel, he sets up this picture for us. He's showing us these two different options of what happens when the presence of God draws near. You can either worship God or the fear of man can keep you from worshiping him and it'll keep you not only from God but from his people. And you you lose joy. You lose joy. So I want us to to catch up on the story because obviously we're skipping quite a few chapters here and it's important that we understand the context of what's happening because, I mean, you can just take a Bible story and really you can make it say anything you want if you don't understand the context of what's going on here. So we want to make sure that we understand the context. It's important. So last week, Mark brought us through 1 Samuel 24 and in this, we saw this story of David. He's hiding in a cave 
Saul's trying to kill him, but Saul, he has to use the bathroom, so he goes into this cave where David and 300 of his mighty men are just waiting. Now, his mighty men think this is the perfect opportunity for David to take the throne that he was promised. Just kill Saul. Now, David's been promised the kingdom by God. He's been anointed by the prophet Samuel. But as David sneaks up on Saul, all he can do is cut off a little bit of Saul's royal robe and immediately he feels guilty and that he shouldn't have done that because he understands that there's a certain timing that God wants him to abide by. He's not supposed to just go and take what's been promised to him. He's supposed to receive what's been promised to him. There is patience involved that God wants David to learn. So rather than take it by force, David has to wait. So now we skip a few chapters, and you end up finding out that Saul, who was king of the time, as well as David's best friend Jonathan, who just so happened to be the next in line for the throne, he is Saul's son, both of them die. They die in battle, it's disastrous, it's really hard for the nation of Israel. And so what happens is the kingdom gets divided in two because they're separated in who they think should lead the nation. So in the north, you have Ish-bosheth. That is really hard to say, by the way. If you are reading through there and you go, I don't know how to say this word, that's entirely okay. Most of the names in the Old Testament, you go, I understand like five of them. Like David's easy to say, Saul's easy to say, but there's so many in there, I don't understand. But anyway, Ish-bosheth, he gets crowned as king in the northern kingdom that they name Israel. David ends up getting crowned as king in the southern kingdom known as Judah. And then you have these two kingdoms that are going back and forth, vying to take over the entire nation. And so there's this bit of a civil war. Then around 2 Samuel chapter 5, Ish-bosheth, he's actually assassinated. And so the northern kingdom of Israel, they don't have a king. They don't know what to do. The only one left is this lame, literally this lame guy who is no use of being king. So they decide, you know what? Let's unite the kingdoms. David can be king. David ends up being a great king for this united nation of Israel that God decides to put together. And this is 2 Samuel 5. And now David is crowned king. So in order to unite the kingdoms, David decides, I shouldn't set up the capital city in the north, and I also shouldn't set up the capital city in the south, because I want them to know that we're one and the same. We're one kingdom. So he decides... Let's go right in the middle. There's this city called Jerusalem. Now, at the time Jerusalem wasn't inhabited by Israel, it was previously undefeatable. It had these waters surrounding it, high walls. It was near impossible to get into. But David, thankfully, he decides, well, I'm going to pray to God, and I'm going to ask him, what's your opinion, God? Should we conquer this city? It seems like it's a good idea. Unlike Saul, he doesn't just go do it first, ask God later. He decides to ask God first, and God tells him, Yes, I'm going to let you defeat the city of Jerusalem. You're going to take it over. It's going to be the house of my people. It's going to be the house of where I'm going to dwell. So David gets his army, and they actually defeat the city of Jerusalem. They take it over, and they are now going to set up Jerusalem as the capital city of this now united nation of Israel. So you can imagine the excitement of the nation. They're pumped. We have a capital city. It was previously undefeatable. We're now going to set up this kingdom, this place that no one's going to be able to attack. This is, you guys have no idea how exciting this is going to be for them. So they want to celebrate. But in order to celebrate right, David realizes that he can't do this without God. So he decides, let's bring the Ark of the Covenant, or the Ark of God, as it's described in 2 Samuel 6, let's bring it to the capital city. This is important, David believes, because it is. This is what we read in chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000, and David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal Judah, bringing up from there the Ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who sits enthroned on the cherubim. So the Ark of the Covenant, or the Ark of God, as it's called here, was this piece of furniture from the tabernacle. The tabernacle was the tent that the nation of Israel carried forth wherever they went in the 40 years that they were in the wilderness after they were exiled 
out of Egypt. Remember, they were slaves there. They were heading towards the promised land. They were there for 40 years. They took this tent with them. God showed himself in fire and smoke. But then it says he dwelled in this ark or on this ark. And so you have this, this huge box. It's covered in gold. On top of it, you have these two angels, not real angels, but they were carved in gold and they've got wings. And so they're sitting on top of this box of gold. Inside the box, you have the Ten Commandments, the two arks, or, or not arks, the two tablets of stone from Moses, among a whole bunch of other things they had in there, kind of relics. And they said on the top of this ark, this is where God would dwell. This is where his presence would dwell. And it's called the mercy seat. So in one sense, this ark, it's just a physical object. It looks great. God had told them how to build it, what it should look like. But it's still just a physical object. But for Israel, it's more than just a physical object because God had said he would dwell there. So it becomes of great spiritual significance. And when we say spiritual significance, I need you to wipe the Western idea of what spiritual means because we often think spiritual means less than, as if the physical is the greatest thing we have, spiritual things are less. But might I suggest physical and spiritual are not competing for one another, but God uses both because he himself, though God is spirit, he indwells a human physical body in Jesus, so he appreciates both. So you have this physical object, the Ark of the Covenant, that is representing a spiritual truth that God sits on a throne, and this throne is with him. Now this throne is coming to Jerusalem. So not only do they conquer this city, they're going to set up a kingdom there, a palace there, the capital city, God is coming to be with them in this city. So as you can imagine, even though God's not confined to one place at one time, he decides this is something that I want the nation of Israel to understand, that I am with them. So he sets up this physical thing to remind them of the greater truth that God is with them. So David brings this ark back to Jerusalem. It's like the picture of the nation understanding God's kingdom, God's throne room is coming to Jerusalem. This is exciting. So they celebrate. They're pumped. They want to welcome God's presence to Jerusalem. So for us, I think one of the things we have to back up and think about, when God's presence is coming to us, do we get excited? We need to realize as Christians, the Holy Spirit is inside of us. So as we gather with the church, whether that's a Sunday, whether your gospel community is gathering together in the middle of the week, the presence of God is gathering to be with his people. The presence of God is being with us. So do we have an excitement in the same way those who are in Jerusalem were excited that God's presence was coming near to them? So they were preparing for this for a long time. They were doing all the things they could to make sure this went right, this went well, because God's presence was going to be with them. So we need to think, do we prepare ourselves for when God's presence in his people are going to be with us? What does Saturday night look for us? Is Saturday night just a night like anything else? Is it a night for me time? I'm going to stay up late because it's the only day I don't have to go to work the next morning? Or is Saturday night a night to prepare to be in the presence of God? Because we know Sunday's coming. We know God's people are getting together. If God is indwelling his people, God's presence is coming near every Sunday morning as we gather. This should be a bigger deal for us than it was for the nation of Israel, but do we actually treat it that way? Additionally, when we gather on Sunday mornings, are we just expecting to sing songs? To hear a guy at the front give us a, you know, a self-help talk, maybe a little bit of a history lesson? And maybe we'll spend some time praying, but I, I'm excited to talk with people, meet with my friends, and we can talk about how you know, the baseball team, the football team, the hockey team either did or didn't do so well last night. Or maybe I'm looking forward to the Formula One race. Those things are all great, but is that the primary reason we're excited about Sunday? 
Or are we excited and are we anticipating that we are going to be in the very presence of God? We need to reframe our thinking on the rest of the week to figure out when God's people are together, there's something special about that because God indwells his people and he wants us to be excited. So this is what the people of Israel are longing for as the ark enters Jerusalem. They're excited because God is making himself, making himself known to them. So we see in verse 5, what happens when the presence of God comes near is first you get celebration. This is what it says. And David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines, castanets and cymbals. There's music. There's percussion. There's an excitement. God's people can't help but sing and gather and praise and honor because God is coming near. Now, this is one of the reasons why as the church gathers, we sing because we're excited about what God has done. We can't help but worship and praise and give honor to God. So if God is with us, we we should be a thankful people. We should be a celebratory people. We're celebrating God is here, God is near, God is with us. For those of us now, we can look back at Jesus and know that God came in flesh. He now sends his Holy Spirit to be with his people. He is with us. This is cause for us to celebrate. Now, That's not to say that every single week when we gather, everyone's going to be happy, excited, in a great mood, ready and willing to go because there's days, there's weeks, there's months, sometimes there are years where we are tired, we're worn out, we're beat up. We're depressed. We've had bad weeks, bad months. Things just aren't going right. Our lives stink. Because maybe we've been battling depression, battling stress, battling sin, battling the enemy, and my life is hard. Clay, how do you expect me to come on a Saturday all happy and joyful when my week has looked like this? And there's sometimes we don't even feel like we can gather with the church because we have this crazy I would say stupid idea that everyone else is going to be happy and excited and I'm the only one that's going to come with my head down. And I'm just going to bum everybody out. So why would I even bother coming? But we forget that Jesus died for us. If he actually took our place that we deserved on the cross, if we trust in him for our salvation, then the Holy Spirit lives in us. So by us refusing to meet with God's people, we are now actually denying God's presence to those who need it. So there are actually going to be times when we're feeling low, we're feeling down, we're not feeling it, where we're going to need to remind ourselves of what is true rather than worrying about how we feel. David who went through some extremely horrific times of depression, sadness, anger. This is what he writes in Psalm 42, verse 11. This is what he writes to himself. He says this, Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? He's wrestling with himself. He understands that he is just a mess. He's depressed, he's angry, he's sad. His soul is just forgetting all the truth of who God is. So then he says, hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation, my God. There are gonna be times where all you can do is repeat this scripture to yourself. When you're feeling down, you're feeling depressed, you feel like, I don't even know why I feel this way. Hope in God. Why? He's my salvation and my God. That never changes. It doesn't matter how we feel. God is always God and he is our salvation. And he has to remind himself that he has reason to praise. He has hope. 
It's not just about us and how we feel. It's about God and his glory and what he deserves. Because our circumstances, just like David's circumstances, should not dictate whether we gather with God's people, whether we worship and praise and give honor to God. But God's character dictates what he deserves, what should happen and how we should respond. It's, it's God's character that defines for us how we should live and how we should respond and how we should do what God's called us to do. So there's actually going to be many times when, he, when we need to remind ourselves and even rebuke ourselves and allow us to be filled with the understanding that God wants us to be with his people because God wants to dwell with his people. And he wants us to be a part of that. And then this is what we see in verse 14 and 15 of 2 Samuel 6. So we're skipping ahead a little. David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the horn. Again, they're excited. I'm sure some of them, they just finished a hard battle. Like they were they would have lost many friends in this battle of taking over Jerusalem. In fact, if you are to read verses, you know, five to seven in chapter six here, they're carrying the ark, it falls down, and one of the guys dies because he wasn't honoring the ark properly. Like, some of them are going to be a little freaked out. It says that David was scared, he was fearful. And yet we see David here dancing before the Lord with all his might. Why would he dance? Because he knows that God is good and God is worthy to be praised. And now just like in maybe Mennonite cultures, some of you might look at this and go, dancing, that sounds bad. I don't think I can dance. I'm not even allowed to raise my hands because that could be construed as worldly. But we see David here dances because he doesn't care what anybody thinks. He doesn't care what the culture thinks. He doesn't care... We're going to see later what his wife thinks. He cares what God thinks. God is worthy. He thinks in this moment to dance. And so he's going to dance. But then we're also told he's wearing a linen ephod. Now, why, the, why would we care what he's wearing? This, I mean, it seems like it's coming out of nowhere because you read through the books of First and Second Samuel and you have to remember these are highly edited books where you get just snippets of things that are going on. You might have 20 years of time pass in a single sentence. So then when we're walking through this, why does the author stop to tell us that David was wearing a linen ephod? I think when things like this are put in there, we have to stop too. We need to think, well, why is this in there? I think one of the things we're supposed to notice is that David is not wearing his royal garments. He's not wearing his war uniform. He's not wearing his armor. Those things are gone. And this is to help us to understand that all he's left with is his linens. These are things that the, the priests would wear underneath all their ornamental garb as well. So I think what, one of the things we get to see out of this, when it comes to worshiping God, we're all at the same level. There's not one of us who is higher than the other. There's no hierarchy when it comes to worshiping God, when it comes to treasuring God, when it comes to responding to God. There's no hierarchy. There's no roles that are higher than one another. David danced before God as one of God's people. That's it. He didn't dance as the king. He didn't dance as the war hero, the military leader. Just a guy who loves God and who was exciting, excited that God was willing to come and be with his people. We need to understand that God doesn't love any of us more than the other based on our, based on our roles, based on any kind of hierarchy, we all have the same position and standing before God. There's God, and then there's us. Anything in here doesn't matter. It's minimal at best. Because we have to understand that all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. We've all fallen short of God's perfect standard. We're all sinners in need of salvation, in need of a rescuer. None of us are more worthy than the other of God's love, his grace, or his mercy. So we all come to God in the same playing field. We're all sinners. But that's the amazing thing about our God is that we get to worship him even as sinners because Jesus puts us on the same page where we're allowed to do so. 
It's only through Jesus' love for us that he brings us into the kingdom of God. So what this means now is that my prayers, Mark's prayers, Jared's prayers, when we're up here leading stuff, they have no more value than do yours. If you gather for a meal, the pastor's prayers don't mean anything more than anyone else. The youngest child at the table who all they can say is, thank you, Jesus, is worth just as much, in fact, I would say more so than the guy who uses a whole bunch of fancy words to try to impress people. That prayer is worth nothing. But when we're worshiping God truly for who he is and not who we think we are, we're all on the same playing field. And I think that's an amazingly beautiful thing that David shows us in this. And so this is David worshiping in humility. He's worshiping God based on who God is, not based on who he is. His kingship, his military leadership has nothing to do with why he's worshiping God. It's entirely because of God. So David knows that God is worthy to be praised regardless of how he feels, regardless of his position, and regardless of how other people perceive him. This is what we see in verse 21. We see this. David said to Michael, it was before the Lord who chose me above your father and above all his house to appoint me as prince over Israel, the people of the Lord, and I will celebrate before the Lord. He's telling his wife, Michal, it doesn't matter my position. I'm worshiping God. I'm worshiping the Lord because of the Lord. So when we worship, let's think about it for a second. What would it look like to worship God and not think about what people think? To remove people out of the equation entirely. What is God worth? If nobody's looking, does that change how you live? I'm not just talking about Sunday mornings. I'm talking about your life. Because just to be clear, when we talk about worship, I'm not talking about a specific time on Sunday morning. I'm not talking about specific actions we do. I'm not talking about a certain moment where, okay, the Spirit of God is at work and now we're worshiping because the guitar is playing this perfect chord progression and now I can really get into it. Now I'm worshiping. That's not what I'm talking about. See, worship is valuing or treasuring God above above all things. So when we do this, when we value or treasure God above all things, we can do that in many ways. So this is why when we sing songs to God, we are worshiping God. When we read the Bible, we're worshiping God. When we're listening to sermons, when we're preaching sermons, we're worshiping God. When you love your neighbor, you're worshiping God. When we eat a sandwich, we have a really nice drink. If we're doing so, valuing and treasuring God above all things, we're worshiping him. But like I said before, the author is intending for us to not just to see David worshiping and let's go be like David. There's also a warning because the fear of man, like I said before, gets in there. And it removes our joy. It removes our ability to properly worship. And so we get this opposite picture in David's wife, Michal. In verse 16, this is how we're introduced to Michal. As the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, the daughter of Saul, notice how she's not referred to as David's wife there, but the daughter of Saul. She looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. And how does she respond? Does she go out and go, yes, God has come to Jerusalem. This is amazing. Let's celebrate together. No, she despised him in her heart. Michal isn't out in the streets welcoming the ark into the city like everybody else. She's not excited about God's presence entering the city. She's looking out of her window. She's far off. She's removed. She's reserved. She wants to see how this all plays out. Now, some of you are like this. Some of you are in this exact same position as Michal right now. Some of you... You're still not a believer yet. You're still observing. You're trying to see what is this Christianity thing about? Who is Jesus? I don't know what's going on here. I want you to know that you're welcome here. 
We want you to keep hearing about Jesus, keep hearing about the scriptures, keep learning, soak it in. That's entirely okay. We want you to keep exploring. But for those of you who claim to be part of the church, for those of you who say, Jesus is my king, I'm a Christian, I trust God. If this is your way of dealing with God's presence, being far off, just observing, this is a very dangerous place for you to be. It's very dangerous. If all you do is watch and not participate, you're in a position where you're going to miss out on so much joy. You're going to miss out on so much of what God wants for you. So if all you do is watch and consume and think through all the reasons you're not a big fan of the way things are happening, what you need to do is come down out of your window and repent. You need to stop consuming, stop observing, and start joining in. God's presence dwells among his people, and if all you do is watch, you're stealing from God. You're stealing from God's people the presence of God that he wants to give them. The gifts that you have to give to God's people, you are stealing from God and stealing from his people. Sometimes that's going to result in because you're not using the gifts to help in the body of Christ as we gather on Sundays. Sometimes it's you're not using the gifts to help the body of Christ as we scatter throughout the rest of the week. You have amazing good news to tell your neighbors, your coworkers, your friends, your family. But if all you ever do is watch and observe the church, but never really be part of the church, you're stealing from God's glory. So you need to realize what Jesus has done. You need to humbly get down off of your high castle window, repent, and stop coming to church. Just stop. Stop coming to church. Stop observing. Stop consuming. And start being the church. Start being amongst God's people. Rejoice together with God's people Tell yourself the truth of who God is, what he's done, how amazing he is, and then join in. Give of your time, of your money, of your talents, of your effort. Serve. Be a part of things. Don't just let Sunday after Sunday go by while all you do is consume. That's pointless. It's worthless. It does nobody any good, least of all you. Because all it's going to do is harbor bitterness in your heart because what is happening is the fear of man week by week by week is going to seep in there. It's going to seep in and all you're going to care about is what are people going to think of me? This is Mikhail's problem. All she cares about is what people think of her. At the end of verse 16, like I said, Mikhail despised David in her heart. She's not associated with David at all here. She's not on team David. She's not on team God. She's associated with Saul, the king who rejected God. The king who didn't want to follow God's commands. The king who didn't want anything to do with God. If we remember a few weeks back, we saw that Michal also had a household idol that was like man-sized in her bedroom. She's not one who's on team Jesus. We don't want to end up like that. If you call yourself a Christian, you don't want to end up where Jesus says at the end of the day, I never knew you. You weren't actually on my team. You might have said it, but when I look at your house, I see, you know, man-sized household idols. I saw you sitting and observing. When God's people celebrated, all you were there doing was nitpicking. You didn't get in. You weren't part of the kingdom of God on earth as it represents the full kingdom of God that is to come. I don't want that for you. I don't want you to be like Mikkel, worrying about what people think of you when you could be graciously reminding one another of what God has done for you. 
See, Michal was more worried about David's actions and how they ruined her reputation than she was worried about what God actually thought about her. See, when David returns home, this is what Michal says in verse 20. And David returned to bless his household. He's coming there to bless Michal, bless his household. But Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, how the king of Israel honored himself today, uncovering himself today before the eyes of his servants, female servants, as one of the vulgar fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. So she's just starting out in sarcasm. You know when you get home from work and your wife just starts out with sarcasm, that's not a good day? This is what David's dealing with. Like just, this is no fun to come home to. She's so filled with fear about how this looks. She has no room for love. No room for celebrating with David. No room for even looking at David through the eyes of what he was actually doing. All she sees is vulgarity. See, David was trying to worship God, demonstrate his lowly position before God. He takes off his royal robes, his military uniform, to let people know, I'm no better than you. And Michal, probably with her royal friends, she's like, the king is taking off his royal robes? What? And they're probably all like, you're going to let him do that? You better give him a talking to when he gets home. She's caring about what other people think. And it robs her of the joy. She doesn't care at all about the fact that David wants to worship God. She cares about how this looks to her friends, to the people out there on the streets. Why aren't you acting like a king, David? Now, for some of us, the culture we live in is going to dictate the fears that we have about how we present ourselves as Christians. But if people know that I think that, I don't know how that's going to make me feel about how I look. If my husband or my wife tells people they're a Christian, how does that make me look? What if I lose business deals? What if I lose clients? What if I lose my job? What if I lose friends? How does that look if they know I go to a church that meets on Sundays? How does it look if people know that I think Jesus is the only way? We're worried about what people think and it robs us of joy. It robs us of the ability to worship God. So we need to ask ourselves, are we more afraid about what our culture says about us? Or are we more afraid with what God is going to say about us at the end of the age? What does God say about you now? There's a faithful servant who loves me. Or there's someone who's scared of me who doesn't actually want to associate with me. So at the end of the day, Michal is completely robbed of her joy. She's completely robbed of the ability to celebrate with God's people. All while David humbly worships God and gets to enjoy God in the presence of the nation. So I want us to see too what the the rest of the nation gets out of this. The ark has come. David is celebrating. We see Michal just festering. Verse 17, And they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts and distributed among all the people the whole multitude of Israel, both men and women. We're going to see what he distributes now. A cake of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisins to each one. Then all the people departed, each to his own house." So the presence of God comes near, the people celebrate, and then they're blessed. God loves to bless his people. God loves to give us joy and celebration, but he loves to bless his people as well. So when God's presence came to Jerusalem, again, we see they received a cake of bread, a portion of meat, a cake of raisins. Now those things you might go, Okay, so he fed them a snack and they they went home. There's a bigger picture here. Remember, physical pictures 
represent greater spiritual truths. Many times, and this is no different. So the bread, this is a symbol of God's provision. So when God's presence is near, we get to understand that God provides. God is a provider. He gives the bread to let them know that. And likewise, the meat, the portion of meat, some translations might say portion of dates, same thing, it's a symbol. Obviously, dates aren't the same as meat. Meat is much better. But it's a symbol, either way, of blessing and joy that God provides in abundance. Not only does he meet our needs, he goes over and above with his grace and his mercy to provide what we don't deserve. And finally, the raisin cakes. Now, if you are at all familiar with the book of Genesis, anytime you see raisin cakes, there's like something going on that feels a little weird. You might feel a little dirty after eating it. Um, Raisin cakes were often used as an aphrodisiac. There's some really weird stuff in Genesis, by the way. Read it and you'll be like, they let kids read this? Whoa. So you just imagine for a second, what would that symbolize? David's saying, God is here. Go home and enjoy your spouse. This is a gift of God. This is a blessing. I want you to enjoy one another and be fruitful. This is a command of God. There were studies a few years ago that said the more Sunday services you averaged attending in a month, the more likely you were to be intimate with your spouse. Not arguing with that. That sounds like a good idea. If you're trying to get your spouse here, maybe tell them that. But God, his presence, it brings to us provision. It brings to us blessing. And it brings to us fruitfulness. And so for those of us right here, right now, we need to think through that something greater than the ark has come. Something way greater. The ark of the covenant, the ark of God coming to Jerusalem, that was a big deal. But God didn't just come in a spiritual sense on a gold ark and say, that's good enough. But God took on a human form, lower in humility than David taking off his royal robes. He took on the form of a man in Jesus. And he lived the perfect life we should have lived. He died the death we should have died. This is humility like we've never seen before. He didn't just dance for God in worship. He laid down his life for God in worship. Jesus is the most humble, the most perfect picture of God, the most perfect picture of the the king making himself low. And he did it... He worshiped God in greater humility than David in a way that said, I don't care what people think. Because so many people told Jesus, stop messing with the religious institution. You're supposed to be taking over Rome, but you keep just messing with the religion. Stop it. You're going to get yourself killed. We want you to take over Rome. If you get yourself killed, you can't take over Rome. And people told him, don't go to the cross. Don't tick people off. But Jesus cared more about what God thought than about what people thought of him. And so he obeyed the Father and he went to the cross for our sake. This is how the Apostle Paul puts it in his letter to the Philippian church. Philippians 2 verse 5 to 8 says this. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. He's saying, think about this. Meditate on this. Let this saturate in your mind. So Christ Jesus, who thought he, sorry, not thought, Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. By taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. This is amazing. Jesus did this for us. Jesus came to be with his people. And not only that, when he died and rose again, he then sent the Holy Spirit to indwell us. I think we forget that. I think we forget that God is with us, in us, and in one another. So like 
The people of Jerusalem were blessed by David. We now get to be reminded that God provides because he sent his son Jesus to be with us. That we know that God gives blessing and joy because not only were we saved from sin, but we now receive a perfect kingly inheritance that we in no way deserve. And he just gives us grace upon grace, not only in this life, but even more so in the next. And we know that God also wants us to go forth and be fruitful, to enjoy our community, the community of God, and to be with one another in a way that glorifies the Father, that glorifies Jesus, that glorifies the Holy Spirit, where now people get to hear of this amazing work. And as the church gathers, that it stirs us up in a way that we can't help but be fruitful. And more and more people hear about Jesus, what he's done for us. So the Holy Spirit changes us. He transforms us. He shapes us. And this is so that we can now engage the culture without fear of what they're going to say. We can love people without worry of what they're going to think about us in return. That's freedom. That's pretty amazing. And now we can go and make disciples because Jesus has given us everything we need. And we can worship God in the meantime with great humility, knowing that Jesus is the greatest one worthy of all our worship. So let's pray. Father, I thank you so much that you have sent your son Jesus to be with us, to live in humility, to worship you in humility in a way that we can't even fathom. I pray that you would give us the ability to worship you and how we see Jesus has worshipped you, that we would lay down our lives for you, that every decision we would make would be made with you, that we would discuss with you why we're doing what we're doing and that is this honoring to you? Is this loving to others? Does this make much of you? Am I worshiping you as I do this? And Father, I pray that you would allow us to experience the blessing that your presence gives. That we would understand you provide, you give joy, and that you want us to be fruitful. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.